Good morning everybody and welcome to our service of worship for Haywood Baptist Church. As always, I am pleased to say on behalf of Haywood Baptist Church that everybody is welcome to take their place at the Feast of God's Grace. There are no outsiders to God's love. Anybody and everybody can experience love, unconditional love that is transforming, healing and brings wholeness with it. I pray that today, as we journey together in our short online service, that something of God's spirit will be present amongst us and we will participate together in the new life which God offers us in and through Jesus Christ. Let's therefore open in prayer as we set our minds and hearts upon God. Gracious and living God, we thank you that first and foremost you are a God of love. And we thank you that in Jesus Christ, you have sent to us the one who is the saviour of the world. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you took upon yourself human flesh. You became, as it were, bread for our lives, water for our thirsting. You came that you might lead us into everlasting life. You opened the gates that hitherto were unopened and you have poured out upon us your precious spirit that the things we talk about we might know truly in the secret inner place of our hearts. Holy Spirit, come amongst us this morning. Join with us as we desire to join with you and create within us clean hearts, hearts able to comprehend afresh that which Jesus has done for us, mirroring the gracious, loving heart of God, whose desire is that we all realise and understand that we are children of Amen. Amen. We're going to have now a song of worship before we come back and hear a reading from the Bible and some thoughts on that. In your holy name, in 
your name There is strength to remain To stand this fight of pain In your holy name You are the sovereign I am Your name is holy You are the pure spotless lamb Your name is holy You are the almighty one Your name is holy Your name is holy. In your name there is mercy for sin. There is safety within. In your holy name. In your name there is strength to remain. To stand this fight of pain. In your holy name, in your name, there is mercy for sin, there is safety within. In your holy name, in your name, there is strength to remain, to stand in spite of pain. In your holy name You are the sovereign I am Your name is holy Holy, your name is holy. Your name is holy. Our reading this morning is taken once again from the Gospel of John and we're in chapter 7 and we're reading from verses 37 all the way through to verses 52. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty Come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. By this, he meant the spirit whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the spirit had not been given since Jesus had not been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said, He is the Messiah. Still others asked, How can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not scripture say that the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of Jesus. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, Why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, 
The guards replied. You mean he's deceived you also? The Pharisees retorted. Have any of the rulers or of the Pharisees believed in him? No, but this mob that knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their own number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it and you will find that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. We join John's um, story of Jesus today where we find Jesus and his followers had gone to a Jewish festival. It's likely that this festival was the Feast of Tabernacles where people would come and make tents and they would think about how they journeyed through the desert as a wandering people and they would celebrate on the last day God's promise of ultimate deliverance and inheritance into the promised land and Jesus is reported to have stood up and said something on this final day of celebration. Jesus and his followers are in a religious setting but I want us to understand that for the Jews, a religious setting was a political and a cultural setting. Um, the whole of society was almost knitted together by the fundamental belief in God, in Yahweh. And so um, it's not that this was a religious setting that a few devoted people were at and others weren't. The whole of the Jewish nation, as far as they could do, would be celebrating this festival far and wide. But I choose to call it a religious setting for a particular reason, because I always find it interesting that Jesus here cries out with a message in a setting that is almost supposedly a setting of fullness and celebration. As if Jesus is wanting to say that there is something more on offer in and through him that religious festivals and celebrations cannot offer. And in fact, those celebrations, maybe for Jesus, are pointing towards his ultimate fulfilment for his people, that of delivering them from bondage to the chaos of sin, the chaos of hatred and self-obsession and revenge and bitterness, which no festival hitherto has been able to do for the people, because whilst they are still feasting together, they are still under the shadow of the Roman Empire. An enemy is still in control. They are not really free. And so Jesus stands up in this religious setting with a something of a divine invitation. Jesus says and appeals to those who are thirsty. And he says, if you are thirsty, come to me and drink. Come to me you who are at the end of your tether, you who have thirsted for freedom for so long and have not found it, look at me and come to me. And I will give you something to drink. Now we've already heard Jesus talk about giving living water when he had that conversation with the woman at the well, the Sumerian, he reminded her that he was able to give living water. And whoever drinks that living water, well, life will almost gush forth from them. 
and it will be an unstoppable stream of life. Jesus invites those who are tired and exhausted and thirsty for freedom and justice to come to him. Ultimately, those who are thirsting for salvation, deliverance. And Jesus says, look, come to me because I am here to give you something that you've not been able to avail yourself of before. I am the giver of living water. We all need water to live. When I go to the gym to exercise, I take water so that I don't dry up and pass out. And the thing with water is that you've got to drink that water in order to be able to fuel yourself and energize yourself. Jesus says, come to me. And not just come and form a queue around me and come and listen to me, but actually believe in me. Because Jesus then gives a promise Although Jesus doesn't really give it, John articulates what Jesus is really meaning. But the promise is that whoever believes, rivers of living water will flow within them. As if there is something that stops human potential and human flourishing. And so something needs to be given to people in order to unstop that inner well of wholeness, to take the lid off, to roll the stone away. And so John says, what Jesus really means here is he's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God that is given to those who believe. Now, I met with a friend of mine earlier this week and we was talking about different religions, different perspectives on um, elements of Christianity and we was asking lots of questions. But there was one thing that I came back to and, and one thing that I think is unique about Jesus and that is Jesus seems to be in my thinking the only person who's ever had the authority to give God's spirit to people and therefore release people into a full and free relationship with God and with humanity. That spirit is in, it enables us to love God, to love our neighbour as ourself, and in that to love ourselves too, to find inner healing. And so there's something rich for me about Jesus. And of course, my belief is Jesus does indeed come from above. <laughs> so he has the authority to give that which humans cannot get for themselves, which is the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Apostle Paul, when he writes to Galatians, he says, look, we're no longer in a kind of slavery to sin because in Jesus, God has sent forth the spirit of, and he calls it the spirit of sonship deep within us, by which we are enabled to cry out in tender relationship, Abba, Father. You see, the giving of the Spirit deep into our hearts enables us to know who we truly are, who we've always been created to be. Jesus in, is able to almost take away the things that oppress and push down true human thriving and life. And so here is the promise. That's why Christianity for me is not really a religion. It's a relationship. It's a place of enlightenment, of knowing the Holy Spirit 
comes to those who believe. And when the Holy Spirit comes, the Holy Spirit changes us. It's a bit like Jesus talks about living water. Water that refreshes and replenishes and brings growth. And sometimes I think because we're from a colder environment, Jesus might have like talked about fire or heat or something like that. It's a bit like we've all got this, this, uh, you know, if you think of a house with central heating, we've all got this, this boiler inside of us and this very tiny pilot light is always there, but it needs to almost be fanned into a flame so that the whole of of our existence can be warmed up, can, can become a, a place that is thriving and safe and good. Jesus comes really to fire up that pilot light, that inquisitiveness, that hunger that we might somehow attain to the eternal life that John and his followers are writing about in this very book. Now, this is all wonderful, isn't it? It's all fantastic. And yet when Jesus gets up and when Jesus says this, the people begin to scratch their heads and ask questions. I love the fact that um, the people don't say, is Jesus a prophet? They say, is he the prophet? As if there was some anticipation amongst the people that there would be an ultimate prophet of all prophets who would bring deliverance to the people. So they ask, is he the prophet? Then it gets upgraded to the Messiah. Is, is this the saviour? And then other people ask questions. Yeah, but Jesus is from Galilee. And, and that doesn't really fit with what we've been taught. And so there are human questions. Human questions of the divine invitation and promise that Jesus gives. Now, it's often the case that when a message is too good to be true, we question it because we can't quite believe unconditional love, this divine invitation, this ultimate promise can really be for us. The Jewish people had been enslaved. They'd never really tasted freedom. And in some senses, that, that perhaps conditions them to never really believe fully that deliverance can be theirs because historically they've had high moments that have always been dashed. So sometimes the entry of Jesus does cause questions. People begin to question. Now they're not questioning, the people at least are not questioning because they're being awful. They're questioning, I think, because they really want to be assured that if they accept this message, Jesus really is who he says he is. Legitimate human questions. But what you get after this, um, yeah, there is a division in the people. The people are divided as to whether Jesus is genuine or not. And that's really John's way of challenging his readers to decide for themselves whether they think Jesus is genuine or not. But when it then comes to the Jewish leaders who are assessing Jesus, they actually, they fundamentally reject Jesus. And they reject him on the premise of the law does not say that somebody from Galilee can be a prophet let alone the Messiah. There's almost a fixation on the part of the leaders to want to put Jesus down because Jesus is getting such a following that their power base is being threatened. And the one thing that happens when power bases are threatened is people become much more fundamental about what is in the word or the law 
And so the basic thing here is that the Jewish leaders are obsessed with a much more fundamental literalist reading of their scriptures and it blinds them to the truth of who Jesus really is and what he's bringing. And it's not just that their insistence on uh, script scriptural literalness is a problem. There's also another problem in that, in a way, there's a jealousy because Jesus hasn't been authorised by the Jewish leaders. That's the other thing. So it's not in the Bible. So therefore, we can't auth uh, give authority to this guy. And yet this guy seems to have an authority from somewhere which we don't have. And so we need to discredit. We need to tear down. Uh, we need to destroy his reputation. Ultimately, we need to take him out of currency somehow with crucifixion. And so there's a rejection. But right at the end of what I've read, there's also a bold move. That's Nicodemus. Nicodemus, in his own sh small way, attempts to put the brakes on with the Jewish leaders. And he doesn't attempt to put the brakes on, I, I, I don't think, because of legalistic protocol. I think here we get the Nicodemus, who's been so impressed by his conversation with Jesus that he's still thinking through and he's becoming enamoured with Jesus. And his bold move, his courageous move, puts him a little bit now on the outside of the sect of the Pharisees. Because they tell him off. They accuse him of being a Galilean too. And they tell him off by saying, you look at what the Bible says and you'll see that you're going down the wrong path. And we have all the evidence we need to convict this man as a criminal. Nicodemus comes in as the secret admirer of Jesus. And in speaking up for Jesus, seems to now get pushed a little bit to the margins where he wasn't before. Jesus, living water. When Jesus comes to us and offers us life and offers us the promise of a new spirit and a new heart and a new way. Sometimes there are legitimate questions to be asked. We all worry and we all fear when it comes to faith. Putting our faith into something that doesn't seem to logically add up and doesn't seem very rational. Jesus, raised from the dead, ascended to the Father, able to give the Spirit, I mean, nobody followed, has followed Jesus with a camera. We just have these words, these summaries, these ideas contained in the book that we're looking at. We all have questions. Sometimes those questions are grounded on our own conditioning and insecurities where we can't quite believe grace would be for us. And sometimes it's just that we have got an inquisitive nature and we want things to add up so that we feel safe in the equation that we've got. But you see, John is always presenting a Jesus that's slightly divisive and unpalatable to religious leaders because he's trying to make the point Jesus is from above. Therefore, he transcends even the religious traditions that people get obsessed with. And he's able as God to reveal himself in any which way he likes. Now, we always have to be careful. I suppose um, speaking to those who live in religious settings particularly, we always have to be careful 
that when God moves in a new way and he's moving in a new way in Jesus, when he moves in new ways amongst us, offering something living because we've started to thirst and die out, we can often default to a literalist reading of the Bible, especially if receiving this new life means we have to let go of old life and perhaps old life that we've been precious about, old traditions, old ways that we've been precious about. And this particular story, I think it challenges us. It challenges us to step up and receive from Jesus and allow Jesus to shape how we read these words as opposed to us using these words to contain Jesus and contain life and contain revelation. There is much more to come from scripture as we read it in and through Jesus. But when Jesus moves in new and fresh ways, there's always that tendency that where we've had power and felt uh, things were precious to us, that we default to the scriptures that have really underwritten our traditions. We could talk about this in the sense of Haywood Baptist Church move into an affirming theology. It does cause a bit of dissonance, you know. We're letting lots of different categories of people on the margins in. And for some, that's difficult because we've had, we've underwritten a lot of, sadly, hatred or phobias with scriptures and we're now saying we're throwing this in the air and we're going to read it through Jesus and the heart of God that Jesus reveals to us the new living way that Jesus has for us and that can mean that what rises up in us is a tendency to reject because what was before was manageable controllable and easy for us now, we can do that, but we can also make bold moves like Nicodemus did. To actually say, we need to pause. We are so obsessed with law and tradition that we've got, we've got to stop and give this man a hearing. Isn't that great? I talked uh, a while ago about the idea of how in the early church they focused on stories before scripture because God was doing a new thing. So Nicodemus is almost saying, look, I want to invite you to listen to this man. You need to have him before you to listen to him. And Nicodemus is clever because he still references the law. He says, well, it is against our law to try a man without hearing him. But Nicodemus is boldly, I think, saying, you need to hear and listen. And just maybe you might understand that there is something radically different about this man. He doesn't really come from Galilee. He comes sent from the Father to us. He is the living bread and the living water. We all have a choice to make, I think, when it comes to Jesus. Do we reject, based on perhaps our human pride, or our love for nice, neat equations, who Jesus is, that he blasts God out of the box? Or do we pause, listen, and endeavour to understand led by the Spirit so that we might come to that place of true believing where God's Spirit indeed resonates with our hearts and releases us into a fullness of life that has not been available to us before. May we ponder on this story. Amen.
redeemer of the wasted years restorer of my soul lover of the desperate heart healing Lord who makes the broken whole light still shining in the darkness hope of those whose hope is gone grace to the undeserving seeker and finder and savior of the wandering one as for me my footsteps were slipping As for me, I had almost lost my way As for me, my strength was almost gone But you lifted me out of the pit Out of the sinking clay You redeemed the years that the locusts have eaten light of the flickering flame you strengthen the ones who are bruised, worn and beaten and lift them and love them restore them and fill them again as for me my footsteps were slipping as for me I had almost lost my way As for me, my strength was almost gone But you lifted me out of the pit Out of the sinking clay You redeemed the years That the locusts have eaten You rekindled the light Of the flickering Beaten and lift them and love them, restore them and fill them again. You forgive them, renew them, rebuild them and fill them again. God bless you folks and thank you for joining with us this morning and I pray that um, as you take away something from that reflection that you will think this week seriously and truly about the reality of who Jesus is. We are of course called to take the kingdom of God into this world with us to manifest Jesus that life he promises we are to allow it to flow out to others so in order to do this as we always do we finish with the words of blessing from the grace that we say together in our church gatherings so let's say together if you know it and if not receive it as a blessing over you let's say the words now May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all and I look forward to being with you again next week. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. 
dancing like never before Oh my soul, I'll worship your holy name The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning it's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Let me be singing when the evening comes Bless the Lord, O oh my soul Worship His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship Your holy name Your rich in love And your soul to anger your name is great and your heart is kind For all your goodness I will keep on singing Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find Bless the Lord, O oh my soul soul worship his holy name sing like never before oh my soul I'll worship your holy name and on that day when my strength is failing The end draws near and my time has come 